Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Keith Garner, Superintendent and CEO of Wesley Mission. I've taken as the theme here in the Wesley Theatre, there's more than one way to serve. And using the words from John's Gospel in the 12th chapter and the eight verses there. Now the concept of service has a longer revered history in the story of our world. So many organizations say, we are about service. But there is a sense in which many people have a hesitation about the concept of service. There are some that prefer to talk about about empowerment rather than service. And part of the difficulty probably lies in the darker side of service, where in fact it seems more akin to slavery than it does from people's choices. However, I don't think we can throw off the concept of service. I think it is bound up in the story of Jesus and the ministry that he offers to us. Jesus called his disciples to be with him in serving others. Jesus modeled service in his own life, spoke about it, demonstrated it. And as we approach Easter, we shall soon see him washing the feet of the disciples. So many of the parables of Jesus have servants within the parables. And it would be unwise to have such a narrow view of the servant that interprets that wrongly. John Wesley's rule, which I introduced here in our Wesley Center about eight years ago, it's written everywhere you turn now in this place, reminds us that we must pitch our understanding of service on a broad canvas if we are to fully understand it. It's been once said that we value what we freely serve. And I think that's probably true. We value most of all in life those things that we give our service to in one form or another. So turning to the 12th chapter of John, we notice its strategic position before Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. As the mood begins to intensify, the the, the trouble that has been mounting begins to take fully shape in the expressions and events that will soon follow, it will intensify and focus upon the passion and suffering of our Lord. The scene that we have before us is set in the home of Lazarus, Mary and Martha, who were close friends of Jesus. Where would it be more appropriate when you feel you've got a great uh, challenge to face than to spend it with friends. And so he goes to spend time in that home that was very much their home at Bethany. It occurs just six days before Jesus' entry into the city, and there's a good deal of anticipation around all that was happening and the tension that was building. And in keeping with a similar recollection that you find in Luke's gospel, Martha does the serving and Mary does the listening. In John, we have this added dimension of Mary anointing Jesus' feet with pure nard. There could well be separate recollections of the same event or different events. But this passage is linked to Luke 7, where a sinful woman anoints in the home of Simon the Pharisee, But there's no requirement because the passages there before us that we have to try to make them fit at every point. In Luke 7, Pharisees looked on with disapproval. But it's not the Pharisees that look on with disapproval in this passage that our attention is drawn to, but Judas Iscariot that looks on with a particular disapproval. And John 12 is devoted to developing the sense of crisis that was mounting for Jesus and the disciples. These are the events that will lead to the cross. Hostility is increasing and is made all the more intensive because the religious leaders had failed in their intent to entangle Jesus in compromising dilemmas or defeat him in public debate. He didn't comply with them in that regard. There has been, at least for John in his writing of the gospel, a certain decline in the popularity of Jesus and his disciples as he refused to engage in the political conversations that they longed to draw him into. 
Uh, he concentrated much more on teaching. In fact, when you turn the following pages in the Gospel of John, you'll find there's a whole section that leads us from chapter 13, where we have the, 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 the Last Supper. We have a whole section which is, is dominated by teaching, not by events. And so there is a sense in which the forces against him are beginning to crystallize. The forces against Jesus are beginning to take shape. They're beginning to, to have a sense in which they are coming out into the open. So to begin to understand this passage in John 12 and relate it in any kind of creative way, we need to see it in its context. And as we've observed, the enemies are turning up the heat. They are beginning to sense that if we are going to have a moment, this is our moment. This is our day in the sun. When we believe our intentions and purposes will be brought to some kind of conclusion. We're told quite really, uh, clearly that Jesus is not free to walk around in the open. That there is a sense in which uh, uh, Jesus is, is not really now free to do all that he would, would want to do. 54 in the, the previous chapter tells us quite clearly. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead he, he withdrew to a region near the desert. So we sense it from all angles that things are beginning to, to, to move towards some kind of climax. That climax we know ultimately will be the cross, but that is yet to be clear to everybody who is watching what is happening. Many people have concentrated on this event and they've seen it in different light. We certainly have to recognize that, that uh, the restriction on Jesus would be due to his ministry, his teaching, his healing, what he was saying, what he was doing, would make it very difficult to be out and about amongst the crowds. His mission was certainly beginning to make an impact upon those that were listening to him. And there's a growing tension in the context of Passover. That's why the reference to Passover is quite clear early in this passage. And despite all this, Jesus shows up at Bethany six days before the Passover. You know when you have a friend when a friend feels able to just turn up. And I suspect this is one of the few places where Jesus was able to do just that. And he turned up at his friend's home. Martha served the supper and Mary seized her opportunity to perform what we might call an act of love. Many people have concentrated on the extravagance of this particular gift. The synoptic gospels give you a slightly different feel of, of, of this event in they talk about breaking an alabaster box that entered our, our language. You'll hear sometimes people talking about generosity in terms of he or she broke the alabaster box and they mean by that that they did that very act that cost them a great, great deal. And not only uh, do we see in, in John that thought of, of anointing, but also that she wipes his feet with her hair. And we see that Mary had a deep affection for Jesus. And part of our difficulty is that we tend to define the, the response of the early followers in too formal or a controlled way. Her love is a decisive emotion. It lies at the heart of discipleship. In Luke's gospel, she who weeps over Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair is described as a sinner. That's why it's quite easy to make a separation between the way that Luke understands that and what we read here in John's gospel. Mary was without doubt a respectable person, a person who had honor, and we've no reason to presume otherwise. But nevertheless, Jesus had given her quality of life, a rich and a, a sense of purpose. For all of us, there's an outpouring of love which goes much further than duty alone will ever give. So a number of things from this passage. First of all, there is diversity in service. There's not one way of serving God. There are many ways. Here we see perhaps just two. Two very different ways of offering service. Jesus enjoyed the warm hospitality in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Mary's serving supper is not insignificant. An ordinary act of hospitality. Mary anointing his feet is an extraordinary act of love. Responding to human need with loving service is a mark of authentic discipleship. 
Many Christian people have expressed that service in a myriad of different ways and organizations and expressions publicly and privately and said, this is how we express our service to God. Offering compassionate care should be a characteristic of all people who are followers of Jesus Christ. An awareness of the different ways that people serve is one of the challenges that we have to face and understand. Service is, of course, alluded to in Matthew's gospel in a characteristic of of any community and in relation to judgment. You remember that powerful passage in Matthew 25 where Jesus talks about prisoners and hurt and those people who are struggling and there's the question, where were we, when, where were you? And all that question tells us that service is not really a passive thing alone. It is something by which we are held accountable to God. And the practical nature in myself responds enthusiastically to Martha. I haven't got a down on Martha. I've had some wonderful Marthas in my congregations. People who are ready, ready to serve God in whatever they could do. And I have, I have to tell you, many people have served meals and saved lives. And so there is a real practical element that that I respond to in her. Then there's that other aspect. That's something in me that affirms almost unreasonable and generous extravagance. Mary will always be remembered for her lavish response to the needs of God. And the real crux of the matter is genuinely giving oneself to God, whether it's at the table like Martha or in devotion like Mary. Both a service. In the account of the sheep and goats to which I referred, there are many questions for us to address. Christ is to be found in the broken people of the world, in the marred face of humanity. Not in its success stories, very often in those places of human need. We will see Christ serving through his people today. Let's also talk now about the our inner motives are often masked, we see in verse 6 in this passage, uh, we have this criticism that's being made uh, um, by Judas Iscariot. This may well be a a typical of the kind of comments that the gospel writers made afterwards. For for example, the gospel writer says, uh, well, he's the one that will betray. Well, clearly that hadn't happened yet, but in retrospect, Judas will be looked at through this particular um, uh, identification Judas is identified as what one commentator called the shocking force of hindsight. But you know, he is very critical, very critical about what Mary does. Judas criticized Mary for spilling costly ointment on the Lord's feet. Try to imagine the inner conflict for him. If he is the one that carries the money bag, the money bag is about helping other people, it would seem entirely reasonable that he should question, is this the kind of expense that one would use toward Jesus? His argument would be that it would have been sold for a great deal of money. In fact, we're told this, this, this a, a year's wages. Now, you may think of yourself as very pious, but if I was to say to you, I want you to do something if you leave this theater tonight, and it's going to cost a year's wages... There'd be some of you who'd be quick to get out that door before it was a accountable moment. Because it really is a lot of money. It really is something that is extravagant. Many church people, I reckon, would have had a lot of sympathy for Judas. He wanted to appear altruistic. Perhaps that's a cloak for his greed. When it comes to money, we often hide ourselves from true motives and values, even from ourselves. One writer said this, Judas is the kind of person who has money on his mind all the while and sees everything from the perspective of pecuniary value. In coming to God, we see ourselves in Christ. The veil of pretense is removed and we're exposed for exactly who we are. This is not only true about Judas, it's true for us all. Mary and Judas stand in sharp contrast to one another. Here is Mary pouring out everything she has. And here is Judas complaining about what Mary's doing. 
Not think about himself, but complaining of what Mary is doing. Fully concerned about the cost. Whilst the other sees the wider picture, and maybe she perceives the shadow of the cross is already to be um, 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 alongside, by, across the, the, the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. Was Mary the only one that was sensitive to his impending death? What we can say is that it was on the mind of Jesus too. And the two met in an action that opened up the thought for those who got eyes to see and ears to hear. When we meet Jesus Christ in the gospel, the real inner motivation for our lives is exposed. So when you observe Martha and Mary, the issue is not what they do, but why they're doing it. So the issue is much more about what is the motivation that lies behind the action as it is being expressed in this moment. When we listen to Jesus Christ in the gospel, our insignificant arguments are swept aside by the all-pervading truth. First observations are not enough. Judas appears to have the honorable, the wider picture as his case. But it's Martha and Mary who see something far bigger. Judas was, had a miserly mind. It's lamentable. His own worst enemy, without doubt. His caustic criticism of Mary is summed up in one account, in the thought, what a waste. I can hear church people saying it. What a waste. Rightly so, Judas. You tell them, what a waste. But of course, it isn't about value here. It is about what is about to happen. And what this woman was doing in these moments will be, as the other gospel writer says, remembered for all time. Not many things in the gospel are spoken about in that way. Remembered for all time. An action in a private house, in a corner, something that many people would never have seen, will be talked about for all time. Hence tonight, here in Australia, we're still talking about it. I have the feeling that one has to be careful in passing such judgment on church folk. But I can hear them say, we have to be careful, you know. And then, thirdly, the aroma of Christian service can be picked up far beyond its immediate focus. When Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. So yes, it is private, but what is happening here can be understood and perceived by the many. The smell of the ointment was associated with a great act of service, an act of love. In the experience of life, we don't give enough attention, I don't think, to the positive aspects of smells. And yet, certain areas of the Christian church do value that understanding. I'm told that when people are selling houses, they're told to get some home-cooked bread going. Make sure there's coffee brewing on the stove. I tell you this, if you went to a house to buy a house and they had bread and coffee, I'd be wary, let me tell you, because all the books are telling you to do it. What they're trying to say is that the smell makes a difference to our response. Aromas of home that remind you be interesting to pass a piece of paper around and say, have you got some favorite smells? There may be some that you recall. For those of us that uh, um, have little children in our families, the smells of children are very special. Some are better than others, one has to admit. But generally speaking, the smell of a child has a powerful communication to all. I've often shared with young people when talking in groups with them about the smells of life, but here we're told that there was a smell with this ointment. Spices and aromatic ointments were costly, not least because they had to be imported from elsewhere. And because of that, the cost was there, so what people smelt was something of great value. And the aroma of this action will be picked up throughout all Christianity. It will be told again and again, not as an advertisement or a pretense of goodness, 
but as a part of what it means to respond to God. When I look back at, across a, now a long ministry, I can remember back in 1981, when in Poland, in, in that part of Eastern Europe, there was a huge crisis on, and hundreds of people were dying on a nightly basis because of the hunger that was there for many of those people. Now, I remember motivating young people to, to raise well, tens of thousands of, of what were British pounds in, in materials to send to Poland. And I remember people uh, making the speech for Judas, we shouldn't be doing this, we've enough need at home, do we really need to do that? Until we receive letters from people from Poland thanking us for trying to do something for their lives. And then in 1989, being part of a project to help people in the Philippines in a center where children were being abused and looked after. And again, feeling that this was the right thing to do. But I tell you, those actions, for me, as I saw young people, and they were essentially younger people, doing something had a smell about them. It had an aroma, an aroma that people could help, couldn't help but, but smell and feel because they, it was the aroma of service. When we examine the ministry of Jesus, we see it focused in actions which demonstrate his healing and forgiveness, and it'll come to a climax when we observe him washing the feet of his disciples. Mary's act of anointing shows an act of love and of beauty for me. For me, the power of the action lies not so much in terms of what she did or how much it cost, but when she did it. Because she, in her own way, was perceiving that what was about to happen only days later would lead to a cross. And across the Kidron Valley, he will enter the city, climbing into the city of Jerusalem to face his foes. This may be the last moment she'll ever have to demonstrate her service. And service has to be exercised. And there are moments to do it. Sometimes I have met people who have been part of the Christian community and they're still waiting for the break. They're still waiting for the moment when they're going to make a difference in the world. I've heard people say, when, when I get the time, when work isn't so busy, when the children have grown up, when things have, have, have come out to me, I'll be able to do something then. And we're still waiting and waiting and waiting. Mary could have decided that I won't use this pure night. I'll put it back in the cupboard, as it were, and use it some other time. But now is the time to use it. That reality is a powerful one. The last moment she might ever have to demonstrate her love. In the Jewish Talmud, there's a saying that says this. A good ungent spreads from the bedroom to the dining hall and so doing has a good name from one end of the world to the other. That helps me to understand the Markham thought that what she's doing will be known across the whole world. It was wrapped up in Jewish thought about smells and actions and service. As the bloodhounds are closing in on Jesus and the crowds will start to gather for the Passover, we will see the true colours of those around Jesus. For service enables our true colours to be seen. Very often a crisis reveals just who we are. I'm grateful to Bruce Milne in his commentary on this particular passage by saying that his public ministry began at Cana in Galilee around a table. And as we move to the close, we have another social occasion at Bethany. The mood, however, is strikingly different. At Cana, in anticipation of the newly launched mission, we observe the sparkling wine of the kingdom compared to the tired, insipid water of Judaism. At Bethany, as the dark, heavy clouds of suffering are building, celebration is muted and conversation will be subdued. Yet as I see it, this is not an entirely negative mood. There are still things to celebrate. The very presence of Lazarus is a sign of new life. And the cross will become the climax of the ministry of Jesus and the doorway to resurrection. You can't but help feel for John, 
who uses this contrast between um, Judas and Mary. It, it's a real concern to retain and to keep while generosity moves the other. Mary took the opportunity when it was given because she knew it may not return. Does that strike a bell for you? Are there things you should do? Things you should be? That you will not have the rest of time to do. And now is the moment when you must decide to do it. She could have left the jar in a place for a week later. But a week later would have been too late. As we stand on the edge of the holiest season in the Christian calendar, we want to offer to him not a controlled and reasonable offering. I sometimes feel when it comes to giving, when it comes to doing something, that we in the church have a habit of almost saying, if you have anything to spare, we'd be glad to take it. Now, whatever else, don't call that a Christian response. From the earliest days, as we observe the ministry of Jesus, as we move to the cross, it is all for Jesus, all for Jesus, if we are to be in any way with and for him. Mary showed unmeasured generosity. She didn't consider whether her gift was an accepted minimum, for this was no ordinary gift. It was no ordinary treasure. The spontaneity of her love was not smothered with caution and prudence. No one, no one did you, I like these words, where we read in the Gospels, let her alone, leave her alone, when we have the incident, when we compare the passages together, leave her alone, because what she's doing in this moment is for all time. No wonder Jesus said that. He loved the open-hearted generosity and liberality of people. The widow who cast everything into the treasury, Zacchaeus up the tree who, who knew what it was to be restored and, and yet gave four times as much as he ever embezzled. Love's excesses are part of the secret of love. How gloomy the, would the world be if there were no such thing as extravagant love? There are many ways to serve. Martha and Mary expressed to us two reasonable, honest ways of serving. But if I had to choose one against much of the better feeling of the story of the church, it would be the one who did the most and who poured out herself, which many of us would have said, you're better in the kitchen. She poured her heart out because of her love for Jesus Christ. There are many ways of service. I suppose as I conclude, the question I want to ask you is how is your service being exercised toward Jesus Christ as we move through his passion. Mm -hmm.